Well, uh, I got a couple questions this morning. I'll just kind of start there. You know, so my wife is now 37 weeks pregnant, which uh, we're kind of in this limbo phase that I really hate, you know, where it's, you know, it might be five days, it might be five weeks, and it's kind of, uh, so it's kind of nice that all the plans I make are in pencil, and it's also, it's just not really uh, my personality to make plans in pencil. So, so I'm, uh, this parenting thing's already kind of ruining my thing. So that's how that goes. But yesterday I had a great time. It was, you know, nice restful Saturday. Um, my wife and I went to a breastfeeding class. So, um, you know, the, until this point, the only latches I thought about were on my gate and they're not, you know, that, so the, if anybody needs, you know, the position, the, you know, anyway. So some of you, I saw some new babies around here. If you need help afterwards, um, I'm, uh, I got two and a half hours under my belt. So, but this, um, again, this is, this is what I do on my Saturdays now. You know, this is like I'm a new person. You know, it's already changing me. Breastfeeding class. And it, so I'm, I'm going to move on. So the, but in all, in all reality, this uh, yesterday and after yesterday, you know, it's kind of those things where, you know, when you first talk about having kids, you know, I mostly am like fearful, not necessarily because of the parenting, but because of all that you give up. And I don't like losing things. You know, and so trying to like, you know, I'm more excited about being a dad than I am about, lo- than I am about losing, you know, but I want to try to be honest and call, call the losses what they are and be able to kind of process through that. And, but I, what I find is that as I get towards the end of the pregnancy, I'm getting more and more excited, which I think is a good sign. Um, so I'm told, so I'm told, yeah. Maybe that's because my uh, illusions are raising, but anyway, so, but this, this verse has been in my mind since yesterday. I'm thinking about the Lord and uh, breastfeeding. So this is Isaiah, this is Isaiah 49, 15. I just want to read this. Um, this does connect to what we're doing today, just so you know. So this, uh, this is what God says. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Yet these, even these may forget, yet I will not forget you that this reality of that God, you know, compares himself to a nursing mother regarding intimacy, connection, closeness, uh, memory. You know, think, how could a woman forget her nursing child? It's like, well, you go sleepless for five weeks, that's what happens, you forget things, you know? But, but God's saying, I don't, I don't get sleepless, I don't get tired, I don't forget, I'm, I'm connected, I'm close. But this picture of God's people as an infant and God as nursing mother it's not to say he is a mother, but this is a metaphor we can use to talk about this. Uh, really connects with our text here we're talking about. Um, that Israel is in their infancy. Um, they are newly delivered out of slavery. They are being reoriented into a new way of existing. That they were slaves. Their whole psychology was sla- shaped by being slaves for 400 years. And then the Lord says, I am giving birth to a new people, to a new nation. That there's this newness of life. And here in this text in particular, Israel grumbles and whines incessantly. And it's pretty embarrassing the first time you read it. It's the word grumbling appears 10 or 12 times. They're quarreling, they're fighting, they're not, you know, I hear the worst part about parenting is when your kids fight, you know, I'm sure there's other worst parts, but that's one thing I hear, you know, is that they're grumbling, just this complaint, and just this reality that one of the things that was just kind of noticing during um, my breastfeeding class yesterday was just this, that these kids, infants, have earned nothing, yet they're just taking, 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 crying, 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 crying earned nothing, and how content mothers are to give what hasn't been earned. And this is one of the things I think we see in this text, is that Israel grumbles, 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 grumbles. But in this sense, they're like an infant, in that the Lord in this text is content to give what hasn't been earned. And this is our big idea um, that we're gonna talk about today, is that God gives us what we need, not what we have earned. And that's true for Israel, it's true for us today. And what we're gonna actually see is there's like four episodes, so it's kind of a longer section of text, so I'm gonna overview it and zoom in and zoom out and zoom in and zoom out. But that God gives us what we need, not what we've earned, and that's good news, because we're pretty incapable of earning things. So let me pray for us, and then we'll walk through this text. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the variety of images and metaphors you give us to 
uh, access um, you and to hear from you and what you're like and how you reveal yourself. I pray that we would be okay with the fact that we can't earn anything, that we'd accept that reality, not that we'd continue grasping to become earners, but we can just make peace with the fact that we are receivers and not achievers, and that we'd see a good father who's content to be patient with his infant children. In the name of your son we pray, amen. Amen. So just to kind of zoom out and get a taste for what's going on here so far. So we're in Exodus, the end of 15, I'm getting into 16, and so we've kind of covered a lot of ground here, and I want to just recap that a little bit before we get into where we're at. So when we started the book of Exodus, Israel has been enslaved 400, 430 years. Grandma, grandma's grandma, grandma's 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 grandma, their whole psychology, their way of being, their existence, their, their, their narrative of what it means to be a person has been shaped by the fact that they've been oppressed and in slavery for 400 years. And then kind of out of the blue, it seems, at the fullness of time, in just the right moment, God shows up and says, I have heard, I have seen your cries, and I am here to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Pharaoh, an arrogant, prideful, political leader, full of himself and his own will and his own plan, refuses to answer the God of heaven and earth with any sense of compliance and keeps just being self-impressed and self-okay. And one of the first lessons we learn in the book of Exodus is that God makes it unsafe for oppressors. That God is here to push back and break down the kingdoms of this earth that oppress and pull down his people. And God begins by um, you know, putting out these plagues and there are these, there's flash, there's fire, there's bang. They're loud, they're noisy, they're terrifying. And one after another, God gives Pharaoh the chance. Now will you let my people go? And Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And he says, no. And God, one after another, giving Pharaoh chance after chance after chance, makes a demonstration of the false gods of Egypt. He tears them down. He tears them apart. And then the final plague, he actually kills the firstborn of all of Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh relents just for a moment. And it's almost like where he's kind of, it seems like maybe Pharaoh's gonna get it. Maybe Pharaoh's gonna go, I'm not the real God. The God of the universe is the real God. And he says, fine, Israel leave. And Israel, two million people strong, go marching out of Egypt. And along the way, God is lighting the way with this column of fire from heaven, this pillar of cloud representing his glory, and he's lighting the way for them. He parts the Red Sea. They walk across the Red Sea. Pharaoh changes his mind, and he says, you know what, never mind, I'm going after them. He sends the, the, the chariots to go, and as they're going through the Red Sea, the Red Sea comes together and again squelches out Pharaoh's people. And Israel walks across dry land. First time in 430 years, they're in freedom. And they're walking on their way to the promised land, and they're there, and things seem to be going well, things are turning up, God has been delivering on his promises, and then all of a sudden, they show their cards, and they act like infants. This is chapter 15, verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness at Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Then they came to Marah. They could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? They whine, they complain. Flash and bang and thunder and hail and the parting of the Red Sea and miracle after miracle after miracle. And they get there and it's just three days and they go, God, do you hate us? Where are you? Some of your parents might feel like this. You just took your kid to Disneyland and you're still in the parking lot. Can I have ice cream? No, you hate us. <laughs> you just spent thousands of dollars, you know. <laughs> you hate us, I know it. And you're like, oh my gosh. Remember five minutes ago what was happening? You know, like, and, and they, they grumble, they complain, they whine. Well, what is, how does God treat them? What does he do? Does he say, whiners, complainers, shut your mouth? No. He sees a log, he threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. He listens to their grumble, and he gives them what they need. You know, I kind of, initially reading this, even hearing about, it's not like the water is poison, it's not like there is no water, it's the water doesn't taste good enough. You know, the line that my dad would feed me that I remember is, I don't like the way dinner tastes. Well, then I guess you're not hungry, you know. If you get hungrier, you'll like the way dinner tastes. 
I expect Yahweh to say that. Oh, you don't like the way the water tastes? Wait a couple more days. Water will taste fine in a couple of days. No, he's, I'm gonna make this water sweet. He throws a log in there um, to somewhat demonstrate his power over just natural process. And then God says this. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord and do what's right in his eyes, I'll put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. This is kind of a moment where if you're writing a movie, you know, and the narrator says, they didn't listen. <laughs> right? Hey, I'm here with you. I'm giving you sweet water. You just need to listen to my voice and you'll be fine. You don't have to have read Exodus before to know that they don't listen. The things go bad. And part of, even if you look at this from the eyes of a Christian, we know that this if, will there be a listener? Will there be a faithful person? Will there ever be an Israelite, a Jew, who faithfully does what the Lord has told them to do? Will that person come? Will there be a faithful covenant keeper who conditionally will say, if you listen, then I will not put the deeds on you. We know that looking forward, that ultimately there is a faithful Jew who does come, who does listen, who does heed the voice of the Lord, who does make it such that the Father doesn't put the diseases on his people that he put on Egypt. But that person hasn't come yet. So when we think about this infancy, this grumbling, I just wanna make the point as we look at this water in the log phase that God hears grumbling and immediately in this situation, he answers them. He provides what they need, not what they've earned. They have still to this point earned nothing, if anything, they've earned a shamey badge of you're acting like a child. But if anything, God is like this kind, loving, nursing mother who when their child cries for food, doesn't say use your words to a three-week-old. Right? But the story goes on. Episode two happens. Let's call this the quail and the manna. And this is where the grumbling theme really hits home. Is, so we just heard you know, you cry, you get what you need. You grumble, you get what you need. But now the grumbling theme takes on even more uh, of a strong thing. Read with me um, chapter 16, verse two. Um, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse seven, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we to you that you grumble against us. See, they're not really grumbling at God, they're grumbling at Moses. Sometimes we have the tendency to blame the leaders for the things we should be blaming God for or to attribute to leaders what we should be attributing to God for. And here in this case, the people are complaining to Moses, you took us out of Egypt. Clearly, Moses didn't do that, the Lord did that. But as soon as the tides turn, they need someone to be angry at. What I see is most close to me, so proximity wins. It's easier to be angry at someone I see than to be angry at someone I don't see. I'm angry at Moses instead of being angry at the Lord. Moses saying, why are you grumbling at me? I'm not the one who freed you from slavery, God did that. If you wanna be mad at him, be mad at him. Don't be mad at me for this. And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full because the Lord heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. If you read this, especially like in oral culture context, the word grumbling just keeps grumble, 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 grumble. And again, if I'm a parent in my flesh, I say, remember yesterday, how I provided for you? What's the difference between today and yesterday? I'm gonna provide for you. How long does it take you to get this? How many times do you beat this in your head? Don't you trust me? Why don't you? And they're infants. They're newborns. And I kind of just want to make this point here is that later on, Israel is rebuked for grumbling. Even in the New Testament, multiple times. Don't be like them in the wilderness. They grumbled, they grumbled, they grumbled. But here, initially, they are not. Why is that? And this is because the Lord is a good parent. That the things you don't rebuke a three month old for, Maybe you do rebuke a three-year-old for, or maybe you do rebuke a 13-year-old for, and you certainly rebuke a 23-year-old for. You know, that when your six-year-old is crying because they're hungry, it's an opportunity to say, let's use our words. You know, we don't need to have tantrums. But when your six-month-old is crying because they're hungry, you just say, I'm glad I get to be a parent. And this is similar with the way that the Lord treats us especially um, as his people. 
as new followers of Jesus, there's a sense in which there's more to be addressed than we could ever address. Right? And there's this hopelessness, a sense of how could I ever be mature? How could I learn everything? How could I stop this sin pattern? How could I get, how could I, what's my political, what's, and there's all these questions, all these concerns, our hearts are unhealthy, we're young, and we're infants. And it's almost a sense in which God is content to let infants be infants and let teenagers be teenagers and let 30-year-olds be 30-year-olds and even in our own development and maturation process. That there's some things you address with one-year-olds, some things you address with 10-year-olds. And this idea of being parented by God is critical for us both in our sense of our vision for our own development and also in the sense of the patience that God has for us. So you see that there's, you know, we, we have milk, then we have solid food, right? We have parented like a teenager, parented like a 30-year-old. And it's actually a mark of bad parenting if you don't parent these different kids' age differently. But God, our Father, is a good parent, and he parents us as we need it in our stage of our own development. So why does God, in this section, never rebuke their grumbling? Well, it's because God treats people like their age. If I was gonna ask you, what spiritual age would you assign yourself? Are you an infant? Are you a teenager? Full of angst, smarter than your parents? You know, that, that's teenager, you know. Maybe some of you, are, you know, what I've never heard is I've never heard someone say, I think spiritually I'm 75, <laughs> you know. Been there, done that. I think there's some, so I'm even curious, like what, what questions or what assessments do you use to help you assess your age? Is it the amount of things you know? Is it the way that you love correctly, incorrectly? Is it your sense of reactivity? Is it the amount of tension you feel? Is it how deeply you love? Is it how disconnected from emotions you are? What is it that, that's interesting for us. How, would, how do we assess our maturity? But here's the point, is I want to get to the patience of our God the Father, that he's content to treat Infants like infants, and Israel in this stage in their development is an infant. And that's good news for those of us who are spiritually young. The next thing I want to see in this section is this, this idea of bread from heaven, that um, God makes this bit of water sweet, and now all of a sudden he is making this, um, um, this food rain from heaven. And there's this uh, sense in which Israel is still being super bitter and st- still being really whiny. And they say in verse 3, chapter 16, verse 3, and the people of Israel said to them, would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, then sat by the meat pots and yet bread to the full, for you have brought us out in this wilderness to kill us in this whole assembly with hunger. You know, my wife and I have a sign in our house. We have two signs in our kitchen. But one in particular says, sorry for what I said when I was hungry. You know, you know there's a whole, you know, hangry thing. You know, that when our physical needs aren't being met, we tend to be snippy and impolite and unkind and unconsiderate. And I, so many degrees, I want to kind of be annoyed at Israel and say, like, man, they're like infants. The other hand, I feel really empathetic with Israel that, you know, you skip dinner and then have a hard conversation with the maker of heaven and earth. You know, it's, it's, it's unpleasant. And there's some degree in which they're being all, you know, in this, this hangry thing is going on. And some of you, um, you know, hangry is not an excuse for sin, but it might help empathize with the people who are sinning against you. But there's this reality that sometimes we need our physical needs met if we're gonna actually be able to think about um, major things. And so Israel's, you know, biting at Moses and the Lord, saying, you know, at least in Egypt when we were slaves, we had meat pots and bread. You know, it would have been better if we got killed in the plagues than we're out here slowly starving to death. Better a swift death than a slow death. The grabbing and moaning. And so God, um, so the people complain to Moses. Moses, rather than taking it personally, takes his complaints right to God. So Moses is able to realize the problem is not with me, the problem is with the Lord. I'm gonna take their complaints to the Lord. That's a great capacity to do that leadership-wise. If you cannot take complaints personally but be able to take them to the Lord, he goes and he says, God, they're frustrated, they're complaining, they're hungry, and God provides these two things. He says, here's what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to have quail come and I'm going to have bread come. So one of the things that uh, we look at here is, is this here that um, they said, come near before the Lord, he's heard your grumbling. And Aaron speaks to the whole congregation. And he says, you shall eat meat at twilight, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and then you'll know that I'm the Lord your God. They have earned nothing, and God is still giving them what they need, despite their immaturity and despite their youthfulness. 
I'm not just gonna give you bread, I'm gonna give you protein. You can get all your macros, you know. <laughs> and what's, what's fascinating even about this, I look at it, it says verse 13, and an evening quail came up and covered the camp. Verse 13, and in the morning dew lay around the camp and when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Later on, they describe that as, in verse 31, now as the house of Israel called its name manna, it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Kind of the point here is they say the quail, that's quail, we know what it is. This other thing, we have like to throw like seven adjectives at it to, to be even begin to like shape the contours. We don't know what it is. In fact, the word manna, manha, in Hebrew just means what is this? So we have quail, and we have what you call it. <laughs> you know, we have quail, and we have I can't believe it's not bread, you know, or whatever you want. Like, there's this, there's this reality. And one of the, it's interesting to me also that this quail in, in this season, in this time of year, in this region, it's actually pretty typical for quail to migrate by the thousands or the millions, thousands and thousands of miles to the point where they fly to the point of exhaustion and then they all land together. And you can literally walk up to a quail that's so tired and grab it and just put it straight um, over the fire and, and eat it. The quail put up no fight because they're so tired. So it's a pretty like natural thing that God's kind of just making Israel go in the stream of where the quail are migrating. But the man, on the other hand, there is no plausible natural explanation for what's going on. They don't even have the words. They don't have the language. That's why you have to use like seven or eight words to describe what's going on. And this, this idea that sometimes God provides quail and sometimes he provides, what do you call it, um, I think really gets to the whole idea of the two ways that God provides. So this is what we call, um, theologians will call that he provides through primary means and he provides through secondary means. That a primary means is God himself acting on our behalf. He answers prayer, he provides a supernatural um, um, providence, he, he moves against the grain of the nature which he created and he answers prayer and he provides what his people need. That's manna, what is this? that none of the liberal or conservative or secular commentaries I read top to bottom had any gut sense of what might have happened about this manna thing. No one who's trying to explain it away, no one who's trying to make it, but versus the quail, pretty much everyone goes like, yeah, God just kind of lined up the quail, you know? And I imagine that there's some Israelites walking around, grabbing the manna, God provided manna, what is it? We don't know what it is. And they see people picking up quail, and they go, I trust in the Lord my God, not in quail. And they just eat their manna. And that sometimes these people who I feel like God provided the quail, they're holding the quail, and they go, do I trust in the Lord or do I trust in quail for my protein? Hmm. And I see that play out a lot of times in the church. Do you trust the Lord or do you trust your psychiatrist? Do you trust the Lord or do you trust your employer, do you trust the Lord? Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust the Lord or do you trust fill in the blank? And these kind of super spiritual Christians, you can call them that, want to draw skepticism to God providing through secondary means. You know, most of the time when God provides money, it's because he provided a job. Most of the time, God provides healing. He provides a doctor. Most of the time, God provides emotional well-being. He provides a therapist. You know, maybe not most of the time, but a lot of the time. I don't want us to be a people who cast skepticism on the people who pick up the quail. And I don't want us to be a people who think that it's better or healthier to only pick up the manna. It's not like some people need quail because, well, they're, you know, they're not as mature as the manna eaters. But God provides through secondary and primary means. He provides through manna and he provides through quail. And he meets this need. But he, and here's what's crazy is, is this idea that God provides manna and he provides quail is actually a massive theme that's picked up in the New Testament. In particular, the manna, the bread sent from heaven that Jesus in the flesh called himself, I am the bread of life that Jesus is the true and greater bread sent from heaven, that he's the one who provides for people in the wilderness of their spiritual journey. He's the people who inexplicably and without cause show up and people are saying, who is this? What is this new thing he's doing? They're talking about Jesus like they're talking about manna. What's going on? 
Where'd you come from? And so we as Christians see the manna in the wilderness. We look forward to a greater manna, a greater inexplicable phenomenon, the born of a virgin man, the perfect Jew, the faithful listener, the one who receives the blessing of the Lord and then passes it on to us. The bread from heaven, the quail and the manna. The next scene we see is in chapter 18, or end of chapter 17. We see this, the Amalekites in Israel. So right after this huge scene unfolds and all this drama goes down, um, Israel is all of a sudden in the wilderness. They newly have protein, they newly have carbs and fat, and they're sitting out there like, like, uh, uh, like fish in a barrel, and then these other ancient countries come out and attack them. And the point I want to kind of make in this is that what happens is, it says, read me in chapter eight, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow and I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Moses takes this staff. Now this staff so far has been used to part the Red Sea. This staff has been used to cast judgment on Pharaoh. This staff represents the authority and the power of the Lord. And so Moses walks out onto a mountain. The battle is going on and it's not just that Moses raises up his hands but he holds up the staff of the Lord and when his hands were up when the staff of the Lord is raised as the pinnacle and the banner of God's people the battle goes well and when his hands go down the battle goes poorly this is partly a picture that the people keep looking to Moses and confusing him with God you did this you did this you did this and when Moses hands go up what do you see standing up you see Moses when his hands go down but when his hands go up it's the staff of the Lord that's leading to the victory And the point here is that Moses, that the Lord, not Moses, is the one providing the victory against the Amalekites. And what ends up happening here is after the story that people are holding up Moses' hands because he's weak, he's not the Lord, he's just a normal human being used by God, that Israel's view of Moses probably goes down because look at him, he's weak, he has feeble arms, he can't hold up the staff. Clearly it's a staff, not Moses. And so God is appropriately lowering people's view of Moses to help humanize him rather than deify him. And at the end, they sing this song, 17, verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is My Banner. Mm-hmm. Saying a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Lord is my banner. Now, banner um, can mean a lot of things, but most specifically here, banner means like a, a sign or a signal or a shield of war. That it's not the sign itself, but it's what that sign represents. You know, even as I'm going to my breastfeeding class yesterday, there's the signs that say, you know, safe drop zone for an infant. People don't want their babies. They can bring their baby here and it'll be a safe place. The sign doesn't make it safe. The sign represents what's behind it that makes it safe. Anything, one of the earliest translations of this doesn't translate this, the Lord is my banner. It translates this, the Lord is my refuge or the Lord is my hiding place. That it's like the banner or the sign in front of a military outpost that if I make it to the banner and go inside those walls, I can be safe. That Israel's out here naked and exposed in the wilderness, attacks from all sides, and they say, we can be safe even here because the Lord is my hiding place, because the Lord is my refuge, because the Lord is my banner. Do you sense that? Do you feel that? The Lord is a shield about you, a hiding place, a refuge, one you can go to. The last episode I want to draw attention to is the beginning of 17, water from the rock. Again, Israel has proved themselves to be a whiny, complainy people. But here in this chapter, what we actually see is that their complaints mature. They become more sophisticated. They go from just grumbling to actually formally filing complaints. Chapter 17, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of Sin, stage by stage, according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses. The word quarrel there could be translated, filed a lawsuit. This is a legal quarrel. This is not just bickering, it is formal litigation. Moses said, they said, Moses, give us water to drink. And Moses said, why are you suing me? Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Remember the last two chapters? You're thirsty, you get taken care of. You're hungry, you get taken care of. We're still serving that same God. God has not changed. Why are you, why are you suing me? The 
people thirsted for water and they grumbled against Moses. Why'd you bring us out of Egypt? Again, they keep confusing Moses for the Lord. So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do to these people? They're almost ready to stone me. We tend to think of stoning as like mob violence, like they just get all riled up and out of control, but stoning was actually formal execution by trial, by, um, um, by committee, that they're formally lo- lawyering, lawyering up against Moses, getting ready to say, you've done this, and now you're gonna stand trial. The question is, who's guilty? Israel is the faithless. Israel is the confused. Israel is the ones who don't understand. People thirsted there for water. And here's how God responds. Verse five, pass on before the people. So just picture a rowdy rowdy crowd. Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders and taking your hand the staff, the rod of judgment. So essentially, you're gonna make a spectacle of this. This is gonna be a scene that's gonna unfold, that there's this dramatic moment about to happen. Make sure all the people see you. Make sure the elders, the elders are gonna be the jury, the ones who decide who's guilty. Pass before the people. Take your staff which you struck the Nile and go. 17 verse six. And behold, I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb. So Yahweh, God is saying, you guys want a trial? We'll have a trial. But Moses isn't on trial. God is putting himself on trial. I'll stand on the rock. In the rock you shall strike. And water will come out of it and the people will drink. Just notice the irony here that Israel are the faithless, infantile sinners seeking to put God slash Moses on trial. God could have very easily said, you know what? You're mixing the metaphor here. I'm the Lord, the judge. You are the people who are on trial. He could have just corrected and said, guess what? You're on trial now, and guess what? You're guilty. You're done. Remember I said, we're not going to put those things uh, of Egypt on you. If you listen, all right, we learned. You don't listen. Judgment on the people of Israel. You are not better than Egypt. This is one of the default things that happens in communities, especially faith communities, is somehow we assume that people outside are worse and people inside are better. Israel's assuming that. We're better than Egypt, but they're not. And God, rather than just correcting them, saying, who do you think you are putting me on trial? God willingly and silently allows the rock to become a metaphor for his presence and said, take the rod of judgment and hit the rock that God is standing in Israel's place in judgment, absorbing into himself the judgment that they should have received. Court is in session, a guilty verdict is rendered of an innocent Lord, and he takes the rock of punishment, and water comes from his side. And it is in God's standing judgment in Israel's place that the water is provided for their life to go on living. Not only is God a good parent who's patient with his infants, but he's a judge who's willing to put himself on trial to save those who should be on trial. This message, this idea that God is the rock, the rest of the Old Testament talks about God is the rock. And here we have God, the rock, standing judgment in Israel's place, receiving the blow of judgment. In the book of Corinthians, Paul says, that rock is Christ. And this is true not just for Israel then, but it's true for us today, that we tend to put God on trial. We tend to decide, would a good God and a loving God do this? Was God justified when he did that? If it's true that this is about the world, maybe I don't wanna believe in that God, and we think that we're the judges of God, but that's just not how it works, that God is the judge of us. And he's not just the judge of us, but he's also the justifier of us, that he stands in our place, Jesus, God in the flesh, the one who listened, the bread from heaven, he stands and says, put me on trial. And he's silent when the people grumble. And he's accused and he does not defend himself. And he stands crucified, pierced, water comes out of his side. And Paul says, Christ is the rock, the means of salvation, the pierced one from whom his side flowed water for the provision of life for his people. 
And this is the message that Christians believe. Not just that God is nice, not just that he's a good parent, not just that he's patient, but that he's substitutionary in his suffering and that he's costly in his love and that we who should have been on trial instead made ourselves the judge and we put to death the author of life and he stood in our place willingly. He's the rock of ages, pierced for us. And we can hide ourselves in him. He's the safe one. He's the one who loves us like a mother. He's the source of our security. He's patient with us when we're young. And he's in process with us as we develop. Do you trust in that God or in something else? Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that you give us what we need, not what we have earned. Help us see that as good news. Help us receive that. Help us cease our striving to earn what you're giving freely. In the name of your son, we pray.